worship the Lord. Of course, any day is just a great day. So I hope you're here this morning with just an excited heart for what God has for us this morning. You know, we're going we're gonna to be in God's word. We're going to sing songs that talk about and worship in the Lord. And, you know, we do it on Wednesday nights, Sunday nights, different age groups, but uh, it's all to draw close to God and just continue to be fed by him. And so lift, let's lift up our hearts, take a deep breath, and let it out, let it out last week, and ask him to fill you with what he has because you're in the right place today. So let's worship. How do we stand in honor of the Lord and lift up his name this morning?
So 
the trials of life and the challenges, Lord, the challenges to our, our faith, the challenges of, of those around us who, who don't know you and love you and who do things that are um, so contrary to your will. I pray that, uh, that as we suffer with sickness or death or um, suffering, Lord, that you would give us the peace of your Holy Spirit and that we would be able to hold on to the hope we have in you and know that it is well with our souls because we know we know our future is secure lord jesus this morning i pray that you would uh, bless moms um, and lord uh, may we uh, truly appreciate the gift to us they are um, thank you lord for all those who who reach out and 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 do that mom job for people who don't have moms around and god how i pray that this morning you would speak to us through your word Lord, that we would grow in our faith, and that we would uh, that we would um, have ears to hear Your word, and that we would become more like Jesus as we as we uh, as we learn and we grow and we and we give ourselves to You. So, Lord, speak to us this morning in Jesus' name. We pray, Amen. Mother's Day. Uh, the kids are dismissed to go to the back for Children's Church. And then I was asked to announce that um, we have two spots available for the Memorial Weekend camping trip. If you are interested, see Jen Cleveland as soon as possible. It's probably going to be first come, first serve. And I don't know how many people you'll have to fight off to get them, but... Um, I'm told that there's two left, so see Jane Cleveland for more information. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Ezekiel chapter 35. Ezekiel chapter 35. We've been going through the book of Ezekiel for a while now and, and uh, through the entire Bible even longer, and now we come to chapter 35, and for those of you who like to take notes and keep outlines, 
we're going to divide chapter 35 into four sections, and I'm calling these sections stanzas. But I want you to be very clear that, that these are not musical in any way, and, and chapter 35 is not a song. So calling them stanzas is more just a convenience for me to divide these up. And so, so if you're a Hebrew scholar and, and you want to write me an angry email saying this is not Hebrew poetry, then my email address is norm at epcbc.org. It's all Greek to me. Yeah, right. Oh. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 35. It starts off by saying, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it, and say to it, Thus says the Lord God. So chapter 35 jumps right in with a word to Ezekiel to prophesy judgment against Mount Seir. So the question is, what is Mount Seir? Well, Mount Seir is another name for Edom, E-D-O-M. And it was, a, it was a kingdom located south of Judah and the Dead Sea. And if the name sounds familiar, it's because it was one of the nations that Ezekiel dealt with in chapters 25 through 32, uh, the, the nations that God called out because of their wickedness and their mistreatment of his people Israel. Now, what do we know about the Edomites? Well, they were descendants of Esau. Esau, as you might recall, was the twin brother of Jacob. And he was the son of Isaac. And you know the story. Isaac, uh, his wife, Rebekah, found herself pregnant. And it says that the twins inside of her struggled. Now, I've talked to women and they've said, Boy, you know, this kid's going to be a football player. I can tell. Well, with Rebecca, uh, she would probably say, boy, these twins, they're engaged in WWE WrestleMania. And so uh, th this is what her, her pregnancy was like. And, and, and God says to her, two nations are inside of you. I mean, is that all? And, and then later on, he says, the older shall serve the younger. Well, the time came and then uh, the, the twins were born. And the first one that came out was all red and hairy. And so they named him Harry. Now, okay, they named him Esau, but that's, that's what that means. Esau means Harry. Now, the second boy came out and he was holding on to Harry's heel. And so they called him Heel Grabber, which as we know is the word Jacob. So, and, and so, so we have this family here. We have Isaac, and by the way, his name means laughter. So laughter had two boys, Harry and Heel Grabber. And so began the struggle. It, it began there even in, in the womb. And there was this struggle between the descendants of Jacob and the descendants of Esau. The other thing to know about Esau is that because of his red hair and because he really, really, really liked the red stew that Jacob would make for him, he got the nickname Red, which means, or which is translated, Edom. So this will be significant later on. And we're going to learn more about Edom as we go along. Now, the question that a lot of Bible teachers have is, why is chapter 35 located in this particular spot of Ezekiel? I mean, chapters 4 through 24 of Ezekiel deals with words of judgment against Judah. And all that wickedness and all that, that iniquity that Judah was guilty of and the judgment that was going to come on him. That's the main theme of chapters 4 through 24. And then chapters 25 through 32, God turns his attention to the nations surrounding Judah, including Edom, and, and he pronounced judgment on them. 
But finally, starting in chapter 33, Ezekiel starts making that transition into talking about the revival and restoration of Israel. I mean, not all the chapters are, are bliss and happiness, but the overall trend is upward. And we have the description of the coming shepherd prince. And, and, and there's going to be a part where it talks about the dry bones coming back to life. And, and, and the, the final battle that is coming up. And spoiler alert, God wins. And, and then there's the, the intricacies of the millennial temple. I mean, after all this gloom and doom, Ezekiel begins to pivot towards some exciting news. But no sooner that we get started on this than wham, chapter 35 arrives. And it's all judgment once again. And it doesn't seem to fit the flow of thought. So, so why do we have chapter 35 located where it is? Well, did you ever notice that when God does something new and different and exciting, he often gets the junk out of the way first? I know a couple whose apartments were recently renovated and they took me in and they, they showed me all the different things that they did. I mean, they did a beautiful job. I mean, they've got new countertops. They've got some, I guess they rewired the place. They've got some, the flooring's all nice. The windows are brand new. Uh, the toilet, the toilet is amazing. There, there's a lever and, and you have to, you pull the lever forward for liquid and pull it, push it backwards for solids. Or maybe it's the other way around. That would explain a lot. Anyway, <laughs> but, but they had to do all this, this, this renovation. But before the upgrades and improvements could be done, the contractor told them they had to pack up their stuff and move it out before they could make all those changes. So in the same way, God is telling Israel, I'm ready to do some house cleaning so we can take care of what's coming next. So he starts off in chapter 35 with the stanza of desolation. The stanza of desolation, verses three and four. It says, behold, O Mount Seir, I am against you. I will stretch out my hand against you and make you most desolate. I shall lay your cities waste and you shall be desolate. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I cannot think of anything more dreadful than to hear God say, I am against you. It's a hard thing to hear because we want God to be for us. We, we expect God to be for us. In the musical Hamilton, there's a particular number where Aaron Burr, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison complain about the fact that Hamilton has an inside connection. And so they sing, it must be nice, it must be nice to have Washington on your side. Well, it must be nice to have God on your side. Now, there was a time in, that, that unless you were part of a religious group or a non-Christian cult, that, that you really had little use for God or the Bible but nowadays, did you ever notice that there is th this, this interest in using the Bible to support some pretty outlandish ideas? I mean, there are politicians who will wave Bible verses to show that theirs is the biblical position. And there are celebrities who will invoke God and Jesus to back up whatever weird theology or philosophy they might be having. 
It must be nice. It must be nice to have God on your side. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, Jesus said, Many will say to me in that day, what day? The day of judgment. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. God was against Edom. Notice, notice the repetition of that word against. Verse 2 says, set your face against Mount Seir. Prophesy against it. I am against you, he says in verse 3. I will stretch out my hand against you. In my translation, the concept of against appears four times in two verses. This is serious stuff. So notice what he says to Edom. He says, I will make you most desolate. I shall lay your cities waste and you shall be desolate. Alexander Keith, who was a minister and Bible scholar in the late 1800s, visited that region. And this is what he had to say upon looking at Edom. He said, I would that the skeptic could stand as I did among the ruins of this city among the rocks and there open the sacred book and read the words of the inspired penman written when this desolate place was one of the greatest cities in the world. I see the scoffer arrested, his cheek pale, his lip quivering, and his heart quaking with fear as the ruined city cries out to him in a voice loud and powerful. He looked at the devastated city <laughs> and he's saying, boy, if all these skeptics could see this and see the ruin and desolation of the once great Edom. Now, at the end of verse 4, you see this phrase, then you shall know that I am the Lord. This expression is what is known as the recognition formula. The recognition formula. So if, if, if there's a quiz after the sermon today and, and you get asked, what, what is the phrase, then you shall know that I am the Lord, you're going to write down recognition formula. Okay, so just, just warning here. It appears some 60 times in Ezekiel. So if you're ever studying Ezekiel, you might want to get a pen and just highlight every time it says, then you shall know that I am the Lord. Uh, usually it's in connection with judgment. So, so the question is, how do you know God is serious about this? Well, look at his judgment. You look at his judgment, then you shall know that I am the Lord. Now, each of the stanzas in chapter 35, except for one of them, ends with the recognition formula. The second stanza, since we've looked at the stanza of desolation, the second stanza is the stanza of bloodshed, verses 5 through 9. The stanza of bloodshed. Because you have had an ancient hatred and have shed the blood of the children of Israel by the power of the sword at the time of their calamity, when their iniquity came to an end, therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, I will prepare you for blood, and blood shall pursue you. Since you have not hated blood, therefore blood shall pursue you. Thus I will make Mount Seir most desolate, and cut off from it the one who leaves and the one who returns. And I will fill its mountains with the slain, on your hills and in your valleys, and in all your ravines, those who are slain by the sword shall fall." I will make you perpetually desolate and your city shall be uninhabited. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. God indicts Edom for having an ancient hatred, he says in verse 5. 
I mean, this ancient hatred started with the struggle in Rebekah's womb. And then later on, when they were older, Esau sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of stew. And then later, when, when, uh, when, when they were even older and Isaac looked like he was about to pass away, Jacob managed to steal Esau's blessing from him. And since that time, the Israelites and the Edomites have been in conflict. After escaping from Egypt, the Israelites were blocked by the Edomites from entering the promised land. There was a series of conflicts with the Edomites during the reigns of Saul, Solomon, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, and Ahaz. In Amos chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, we see sort of a summary statement about the hatred of Edom toward Israel. It says, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because he pursued his brother with a sword and cast off all pity. His anger tore perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. But I will send a fire upon Teman, which shall devour the palaces of Basra. He goes on to indict Edom for their bloodshed against Israel. Listen to these words again from verses 5 and 6. He says, You have shed the blood of the children of Israel by the power of the sword. I will prepare you for blood, and blood shall pursue you, since you have not hated blood, therefore blood shall pursue you. You notice the repetition of the word blood? And it's almost like a drumbeat. The word blood is a play on words with the word Edom, which means red so what god is saying in essence is okay red you like red so much i'll give you red i'll give you lots of red i'll give you more red than you can handle so he goes on and he says i will make you perpetually desolate and your city shall be uninhabited now most of you would probably not be able to find Edom on a map. But one of the major cities in Edom is the city of Petra. And I think a lot of you probably have seen Petra. If you have watched the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, remember toward the end where Indy and his father are hunting for the Holy Grail and they track it to this big palace that seems to be embedded in the rock and you can only get to it through these tall, narrow canyons. Okay, that was filmed in Petra. Uh, they, 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 it, it's a great movie. I should have brought a clip. We could have had fun. Well, from 550 B.C. to 400 B.C., the Edomites were overrun and ransacked. Uh, Others came until the time of the Crusades when it was once again completely deserted and never heard from again until the archaeologists rediscovered it in the 1800s. And the whole area is, is desert, One writer describes it this way. Once a mighty fortress situated on a major trade route between North Africa and Europe. Now all that is left is a bunch of empty stones, a wasteland of thorns and thistles, crawling with snakes, lizards, and owls by night, while birds of prey can be seen circling the skies overhead by day. Then he concludes by saying, During our time, the only men who come to its gates are tourists who marvel at how such a mighty kingdom could have fallen. That's all Edom is good for now. It's a tourist attraction. 
Otherwise, it's just rock and dirt and wild animals. This shows that God is dealing with this. By this, they shall know that I am the Lord. The third stanza, verses 10 through 13, is the stanza of possession. It says, because you have said these two nations and these two countries shall be mine and we shall possess them, although the Lord was there. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, I will do according to your anger and according to the envy which you showed in your hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them when I judge you. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have heard all your blasphemies which you have spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, They are desolate, they are given to us to consume. Thus with your mouth you have boasted against me and multiplied your words against me. I have heard them. The Edomites had taken advantage of Israel's vulnerability to join with their enemies in attacking Israel. And they wanted the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah for themselves. The psalmist says in Psalm 137, 7, Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. That's raise with a Z, meaning to tear down. The Babylonians were coming in and the Edomites were cheering them on and saying, go get them, tear it down. Because obviously once they tore it down, they could just walk in and take over. The prophet Obadiah says in verses 13 and 14, you should not have entered the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Indeed, you should not have gazed on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. You should not have stood at the crossroads to cut off those among, whom, among them who escaped, nor should you have delivered up those among them who remained in the day of distress. I mean, the enemy armies succeeded in overthrowing Jerusalem. And so we can come in there. We can have the city. One problem. At the end of verse 10, God says, even if the city were to be put down, the Lord was there. Even after the disaster and the devastation of the city, the Lord was there. You know, the very last words of the book of Ezekiel, chapter 48, verse 35, after the incredibly detailed description of the millennial temple and the new city, God says the name of that city is, the Lord is there. So in spite of disaster and catastrophe, the Lord is there. In times of blessing and prosperity, the Lord is there. When the righteous are in office and, and, and their policies uphold God's people, the Lord is there. When the wicked rise up and seem to have the upper hand against God's people, the Lord is there. When you get up in the morning and your bills are paid and the sun is shining, the Lord is there. And when you can't move and you're struggling, guess what? The Lord is there. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The Lord is there. 
Now remember how we said that the recognition formula was at the end of each of these stanzas except for one? Well, this is the one where it isn't. This is the exception. It's kind of in the middle, verses 11 and 12. He says, Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, I will do according to your anger and according to the envy which you showed in your hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them when I judge you. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Edom's sin was this perpetual hatred and Edom's punishment was perpetual desolation. And then you shall know that I am the Lord. Then it gets better. He talks about the blasphemies that they committed against Israel. Because you see, when a city fell, they, they often spoke to the, uh, the, the people and said, okay, your city has fallen. That means God has abandoned you. And he talks about these blasphemies and I, we would call it today trash talk. Or they're talking smack against whatever we want to phrase. And, and he concludes by saying, Thus with, the, with your mouth you have boasted against me and multiplied your words against me. I have heard them. Read that again. With your mouth you have boasted against me and multiplied your words against me. I have heard them, God says. Not only is the Lord there, but the Lord is listening. God has heard the Edomites and what they said. When I was a kid, my mom always knew when I did or said something that I wasn't supposed to do or say. And I always thought I'd get away with it. I thought I was sneaky enough and, and quiet enough and everything. And, and she didn't hear anything. She didn't see anything. That's what I thought. But she always knew. I don't know how she did that. I and mean, this is before the internet. Some of you remember growing up in church. And, and, and your mom maybe had this supernatural ability to be singing a hymn, you know, wonderful grace of Jesus. And she'd have this angelic smile on her face. But she always, at the same time, have that look in her eye. Because she saw you doing something that you were not supposed to be doing in church. Remember that? The Edomites were saying terrible things about God and God's people. But God heard. God heard. So, Edom, you think you're possessing the land? Guess what? The Lord is there and he hears Verses 14 and 15, this is the last stanza. Thus says the Lord God, the whole earth will rejoice when I make you desolate. As you rejoice because the inheritance of the house of Israel was desolate, so I will do to you. You shall be desolate, O Mount Seir, as well as all of Edom, all of it, just in case you missed the point. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Back in verse 12 of Obadiah, God says through the prophet that you should not have gazed on the day of your brother in the day of his captivity, nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. You shouldn't have done that, Edom. Warren Wiersbe, the great writer, says, in their arrogance, Edom rejoiced over the fall of Israel. But one day, the whole earth would rejoice over the fall of Edom. And then, 
they shall know that I am the Lord. What are we supposed to take away from this? The fact that the Lord is there. The Lord is there. And and while this is meant as a warning to Edom, it can also be words of great blessing to, uh, to us. So today, ask him to take care of the ancient foes in your life. That habit, that, that addiction, that unconfessed sin, whatever is holding you back from growing in your relationship to the Lord, ask God to clean house and do the renovation and work in you. And maybe you're here today, you've never, ever trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. This is the starting point. This is the starting point. God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, came to earth as a human being. He lived a sinless life and he died on the cross to pay the price for your sins and mine. And then three days later, he came back to life so that by trusting him as your Lord and Savior, you can have everlasting life and a day-to-day relationship with him. Today can be the start of that transition in your life. And I would encourage you, if you have questions about this or you want to know more, come see us right after the service. We'll be happy to talk to you about it. Right now, let's bow our heads and look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you that you're there and that you listen. We thank you, Father God, for these words from Ezekiel. And we thank you for taking care of this old enemy. As you're getting ready in our text to show restoration and revival to your people. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and caring for us. And I pray for everyone here today that if there are some things that they need to bring before you, to bring out into the light, that this would be the day that they do this. And if there's anybody here who's never known the joy of knowing Jesus as their Savior, I pray that this would be the day that they would do that. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to worship. I would invite you to stand and join with us as we worship the the God that is here. Oh, 
Touching every heart I worship you I worship you You are here Healing every heart I worship you I worship you You are here Turning lives around I worship you
There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus has overcome And the grave is over
the voice of many angels say, Worthy is the Lamb, and I hear the cry of every longing heart. Worthy is the Lamb, and I hear the bow our heads. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together that we could worship you and hear from your word. Let's bless our time this afternoon. Thank you for our mothers and mother figures. And Lord, we just pray you'd guide us and lead us and direct us. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think by the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Have a great week. Thank you.